going. How are we doing, Greg? Good, Bobby. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, taking the time, especially with uh, everything that's going on right now. But uh, cheers, first and foremost, virtually. <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah. Now, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now, starting out for you personally, uh, such an amazing story, in my opinion. I mean, you truly are uh, a pioneer and really a uh, visionary. You know, I did a lot of research on it. And when you were kind of going with micro craft breweries and beers, there were uh, eight in 1980 when I did the research on it. And now there's over 7,500 today. Yeah, I'm not surprised if not even more, but probably 25 plus here in Utah alone. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. So the, the vision that you have, you know, uh, to me, you're really truly similar to like a Steve Jobs and just the fact that you have such uh, vision and passion and hard work. Um, and it really is a great American success story. So I'm really uh, mm -hmm. glad that you're able to take the time today. I appreciate the exaggerated analogy, but um, I guess if there's any, we're both um, kind of stubborn, pig-headed guys, so I guess th there's that in common. So now, how do you, how do you make your way to uh, Utah from the beginning? Let's uh, let's go back towards uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Okay, so I grew up in Milwaukee. Um, coincidentally, that you know the so-called beer capital. Uh, so I just had a beer. Um, in my, in my uh, kind of background and uh, drank a lot of beer, a lot of uh, PBR in my day going up in Milwaukee. The drinking age was 18, so that meant you could start at 16 or 17. So I um, always had a beer. My, my parents were beer drinkers, not crazy beer drinkers, but pretty enthusiastic. So I had that and uh, ended up after a couple different colleges, got to go to school in Rome for a year, which was really a highlight. And then, uh, ended up graduating from Marquette University in Milwaukee in 1974 and um, I went to my parents and I said listen I think I'm going to go out to Utah and meet with my brother Skip and I said I'm wondering I'd like to get going do you care if we skip graduation and they had had five kids and plenty of graduation so they looked at me and said yeah you know that'll be all right so my mom took me to the interstate in 94 my backpack and my hippie garb on and um, smiled at me and I was going to hitchhike out to Utah and before I got out of the car she said honey I, I want you to smile because nobody wants to pick up a grump so I'm out there on I-94 up to, and then connecting with Interstate 80 and hitchhiked out to Park City in 1974 and have been here ever since. Wow so now why Utah? Just because was your brother there, or how? Did Pretty much, that was the. Yeah, I think it was a. It was a couple, couple uh, factors, Bobby. One was, you know, growing. I I ended up although I didn't live on at home. I was still in my native city when I graduated, so I had some pent up need to kind of see the world. Even though I'd gone to school in Rome, I, and other than that, I think it was just to try to be a pioneer or, or do something exciting. Um, plus, the mountains had a an attraction for someone growing up in the Midwest. I had gone out to Colorado to see my brother in school and I, I was just blown away by the, the whole Western scenery and, and uh, said, uh, you know, that's, that's where I'd like to live someday. So it was a combination of factors, but mostly just to, you know, my, my brother was in school in Colorado and he said, we gotta go further West because Colorado's already been discovered. This is in 1974. So um, we, he took off from, from Boulder, Colorado, and went to Park City. And in those days, it was a perfect fit because Park City was 1974. It was just starting to scratch the surface of being a ski town, and the mines were still barely open, but, but open at that time. And um, and we were two total dirtbag hippies, you know, 1974, long hair. And the Park City was kind of like a dirtbag hippie at the time. So we kind of fit in and eventually kind of grew up with the town because the town started to evolve and then we were ready to plug in and you know be more of a permanent fixture of society and and start to look for opportunities so we, it was kind of interesting how we now i don't know i'm now that i'm retired i think i'm worried about you know park city now is and sometimes sometimes not at this moment but in the recent years this has gotten so popular it's almost in my mind getting loved to death as far as you know the traffic and the impact but that, that's another story 
Yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's a lot different as I've grown up here and I have been here nearly as long as, as you have. <laughs> so what, what was it like drinking beer back in uh, Park City in the 70s? Well, you know, it wasn't, at that point, there weren't really any options. I mean, you, you had Bud dominating and then you had Coors, which was big out west. And, you know, and then you could go to the liquor store and maybe buy a, an import. But uh, there weren't a lot of choices like there are today, that's for sure. It was pretty much mainstream U.S. breweries. And that was, that was it. You know, the, the most adventurous the breweries got was started making light beer in about 19... 71 72 and but other than that it was pbr and miller coors budweiser and that's about it so when do you start to get the when does that idea first come to the yeah so i was here for quite a while I just started the brewery in 1986 but so between 1974 and 1986 i went through a number of, of career changes i started out working with my brother and he was aspiring to be a contractor builder so i ended up Kind of being a labor as a construction crew and that really didn't light me up too much that wasn't really my skill set um then a bunch of guys in town here i don't know if you know any of these names but jan wilking and steve Deering and hank lewis we decided to start a local newspaper actually we tried to buy the park record but we thought they wanted too much money so we pooled our funds and started a paper and we couldn't come up with a name and we Part of the rationale was we called it the newspaper because we thought when people came into town, they say, where's, where's the local newspaper? So we thought we had a clever advantage there. So we did that. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. Um, my partner, Jan, stuck it out and Steve, and they ended up acquiring the park record at a later date and that, as controlling partners, and that's how it's operated today. But uh, I, actually, it's sold it quite a few years ago. But So we did that, and then um, through the experience as a reporter photographer I got a job with the U.S. ski team and um, I don't know if they still have it you would know about it the North American ski series which is um, you know the biggest series that's not on the World Cup basically yep, yep they still so I went to work um, chasing the ski team from one side of the uh, country to the other one day I, dro I drove from Mount Tremont not in one day, but then all the way to Vancouver. So I had a little ski team, Subaru, all um, decaled up. And so my job was to write a report in the, in the, the, the uh, ski race that I was covering, list the I think, top 10, and then try to get as much copy as I could in. And then call the local press, call the UPI um, and AP, and, and try to get some publicity for the sponsor of the, of the ski circuit. So I did that for a year and that was enough because that was a lot of traveling. And, and then uh, evolved into, um, what else did I do then? Eventually ended up doing real estate for a while with my brother. He had gone on to become a contractor and do some, some of the first developments in Park City. So I was his real estate broker and that, was, that worked out pretty well. And that actually gave me some income flow to save so that I knew at some point I wanted to start my own business. I had a hard time identifying that, but I, I can tell you how that happened if, you, if you'd like to get into that. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm madly, you know, I'm not happy being a real estate agent sitting in open houses. And so I'm thinking I gotta start something. So, so I started, I had some really smart friends who were helping me and I started looking at opportunities, everything from, you know, pizza parlors to ski shops, you name it, and never could quite take the leap. Then in 1975, I'm sorry, 1985, a, a old college roommate living in Seattle said, sure, if you got to come up to Seattle for Thanksgiving, and I want you to meet somebody. And I was single and, you know, I said, sure, sounds fun. So I go up to Seattle and I meet a guy named Tom Bond who started Pyramid Brewing. Um, okay. just, and uh, he just, it just turned my whole outlook on the whole, you know, he was right there, you know, with Sierra Nevada as being one of the first Western in those days, we were known as microbreweries instead of craft breweries. And that's because we were pretty micro. But um, so I met this guy, Tom Bond, and it, we got into some discussions. And I, I said, I should do that in Utah. And he knew a little bit about Utah. He, you know, he wasn't the one that called me crazy at first. But he's, so I eventually struck a deal with him to, to be a consultant so I, you know, I could get started. And um, so I came home from Seattle and tried to conjure up, write a business plan and meeting with 
Tom Vaughn on a regular basis and uh, had a hard time getting the financing because people would literally look at me like it was you know, crazy when I told them I wanted to start a brewery in Utah. You know? <laughs> breweries anywhere was not a good idea in those days because more breweries were closing than opening. Yeah. So the idea of starting a brewery in Utah got some pretty weird reactions. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, like I was saying before, and the, there was only eight. Which I, being called crazy was really an encouragement. Yeah. When they told me I couldn't do it, that, that was helpful. That was a motivation. So that was part of the, uh, the drive for you. Now, have you, so. have you always kind of had that competitive drive, kind of strive yeah. to? I think so. Yeah, I did. You know, growing up, um, I had kind of a, I had that hippie anti or countercultural um, mentality going. You know, I really was thought we could change the world. And so anything that said couldn't be done. And I did that. I mean, I kind of grew up with that, that kind of mentality. I mean, even in high school playing sports, I, an example I could offer was, I was 170 pounds in playing football. And I, told the coach that I wanted to play fullback and linebacker and I was 170 pounds and he just said, you know, that's, I went to an all boys school in Milwaukee and he was like, I don't know about that. And uh, so anyway, it evolved through practices and I ended up beating out a guy that was 210 and faster than I was because I was, I think, more competitive, more motivated, just nastier. And, and uh, so that's always been, a, you know, that when someone says you can't do it, uh, whatever it is, and that'll come into play later when I wanted to open the brew pub. But there's always something in my nature that when people told you you couldn't do it, man, that just fired me up. That's a great, uh, that's a great trait to have <laughs> as it'll play out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes it didn't work out well, but you know, it, it just, I think there is something in people that have, you call the competitiveness, I think that's accurate. I think, um, just kind of call it a bulldog um, determination and, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that go into it. But, yeah, I think some people – you see it sometimes in athletics is a good point where some people aren't necessarily the most, most skilled, but they're the most determined, perhaps, or most competitive. Mm -hmm. and, and you get someone that combines skill with competitiveness, you, you know, you get a Michael Jordan. But um, in my case, I was just a survivor. Now, you had talked about how you had always wanted to start a business or start mm -hmm. something of your own. And then you get into what kind of tape do you have to clear with the state to try to get a brewery going? What is that? Yeah. So I got the business plan going. I finally got a, a bank to lend me a $150,000 with the SBA loan and uh, had some savings. So that's got us off the ground. But um, initially getting the, when I went down to the Department of Alcohol Beverage Control in Salt Lake, I said, I want to start a brewery. I, I need a license application. And they said, well, we don't have an application for a brewery because nobody's ever asked us for one before. And uh, the last brewery in Utah, they had some brewing history with um, Becker Brew in Ogden and then uh, later with Fisher Brewing here in Salt Lake. They had been closed for quite a while. So uh, they said, listen, you're going to have a hard time getting a federal license. They put you through a lot of hoops. But if you give a federal license, we'll consider that application for a state license. And, you're good to go. So that was, there still, there wasn't any statute or legislative initiatives necessary to start a brewery. It was already on the books. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, when I wanted to start a brew pub, it was a, it was a much different story because that was not on the books and wasn't legal at the time. Hmm. So, so, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question or not. But. No, that's, uh, that's a, great, uh, a great start. So originally it wasn't, called Wasatch Beers, right? Wasn't it Shirt? Oh, yeah, it was Shirt Brewing Company, but we always, I wanted to name the beer, and this is funny, this gives you an idea of how limited my scope was at the time, and I just was more in survival mode, but I really struggled with calling, I wanted to call the beers, um, I didn't, I, temp, I was tempted to call it Shirt Brewing Company, but I thought that was a, a little too, um, I don't know, self-serving, or I thought I, I needed a, a regional name, and I, and I went through a lot of names and ended up with one of the first considerations, which wasn't terribly creative. Wasatch, of course, the name of our mountain range, you know, there's some Wasatch Plumbing and Wasatch Electric. Now we have Wasatch Brewery. So um, the name was meant to be immediately synonymous with Utah. So I thought the mountains achieved that name. Um, 
later on when I was trying to sell beer out of state, people couldn't pronounce Wasatch and didn't know what the hell it meant and didn't know, you know where it came from. But initially, it identified us as the local brewery. Mm-hmm. How much of a shock was that for people around the state to now have? Well, the, you know, the beer drinkers loved it. Um, there's a guy named um, Bob um, Wood. He called him Woody. He was the editor of the Salt Lake Tribune at the time. This is back in 1985, 86. Wonderful guy. Uh, it's when the newspapers were flourishing and they had a whole business section in the Salt Lake Tribune every Sunday. So that, so, um, yeah, I, my, I said to him in the story that was kind of taken out and, you know, how they do in, in articles, kind of italicize the a paragraph or a sentence or two. And I told him, I said, you know, it's going to be hard because people, half the people in Utah don't drink beer. So it's going to be incumbent of, on those of us that do to make up for them. And that was kind of my business plan. Hit the, hit, hit the local, hit the beer drinkers. It was really an uh, interesting marketing advantage too, but so yeah, half the people don't drink beer. So I have to appeal to those that do. And then obviously the, the involvement as a ski town and resort town, depending heavily on the tourist factor. And, and that ended up being a big part of our being able to, to make a go, a go of it was the tourist, the, you know, the people that came here and they always wanted to drink the local beer. So that was a big help. Now, how, what was the process like creating that first beer, getting that first, because how many? Oh, gosh. Beers, how yeah. Many? I ended up hiring a gal named Melly Coleman, who uh, was a really smart young woman, had a, I think a master's in civil engineering and never had a lot of, had a lot of enthusiasm in brewing, but never really, any kind of background in brewing. So we worked with, sent her up to kind of apprentice with Tom Bond at Pyramid and sent her to a school back in Chicago called Siebel's Brewing Institute. So we were both faking it big time because we didn't really know what we were doing. And uh, so the first beer was, was a real adventure. Um, we had kind of a, a open um, hop um, catch that, when we went through our heat exchanger, it, it clogged up the heat exchanger and, and uh, beer was flying everywhere. And it, it, you know, it was, it was a real learning process and, you know, Melly got better and better. And um, so, yeah, the first brew and, and then we had a grand opening party in, uh, in Park City in, in, in uh, it was like October 25th of 1986. And I put an ad in the park record saying, you know, Wasatch Beer, Shirt Brewing, Wasatch Beer is opening on Iron Horse Drive, grand opening, all welcome, free beer. And immediately before I even sold my first beer, I'd broken about every major law in Utah statute about how to regulate beer. We had, we had no ID and we had no fence around it. We had, yeah. We just had, and people, you say free beer in a resort town or Park City, and we had a couple hundred people, went through, I think, eight or nine kegs and had a wonderful day. The weather cooperated. It was really warm day for October and people were showing up and I mean we had half the town here and uh, that was our our first kind of initiation in, into the beer market we got the locals fired up and those days we just made one beer it was called Wasatch Premium Ale we later added Wasatch Gold um, but uh, was w- w- very far away from all the exotic beers that are made today you know with the, with the IPAs and everything else that's going on but we were just trying to get a beer out the door and, and premium ale was what Pyramid was making, something similar and, and of course um, Sierra Nevada. And those guys, um, um, you know, we were all small fraternity in those days because it hadn't grown real competitive yet, certainly on a, on a national level. We were all just trying to see what we could do with our local markets. Mm-hmm. How well was it received? Um, you know, in honesty, Bobby, people were anxious and willing and enthusiastic to have a local beer and, or a lot of beer drinkers. In all honesty, in those days, we made some really new tasty beer for people. And then we're in the learning curve and we made some beer that wasn't so great early on. Sure. So, you know, the consumer was, was really, um, you know, uh, considerate to our challenges and, also, the other prop, the other advantage we had is if we made a bad batch of beer, um, and we were in the ski season, that tourist would leave town, and the 
the next group would come in and they didn't you know know anything about it and so we get like a fresh slate to offer another a new beer after we, we got a little better at it so that um you know that that was an interesting time but um you know melly was coming from scratch so she was getting into it and, um, but in those days you know I don't, today you wouldn't get that kind of uh, latitude i think people now when a new beer comes out you better have have it together because people have so many choices they have such a developed palate they have so much awareness and, and so much of a um, ability to identify a good beer from bad beer and uh, so that wouldn't have worked so well today but back in 1986 we kind of got away with it gotcha now where does the idea for a brew pub come into play well that's that's kind of where it gets interesting so for two years um, clearly by two years, even a little before two years, we were having a lot of fun where we beer was getting better. We were making and selling beer, but you know, I was living off t-shirt sales. Um, it was really a struggle financially. So I'm like thinking, you know, I want to do, I want to keep doing this, but how do I make a living? And then through the grapevine, or I heard about this concept that was tried in California called a brew pub. And when someone explained it to me, you make the beer on premise, you sell it directly to the consumer and you avoid all the packaging expenses, you, do, you avoid distribution expenses. Mm -hmm. You just go from the basement to the bar as you've seen us do. And uh, that's a brilliant business plan. And that's why they, they became so prolific and uh, across the country. You know, the ubiquitousness of the brew pub was because it's a great business plan because yeah. I don't know if you can do it today, but in, the, in that day, we strove for a 10% cost of goods, okay. which gave you a nice margin. Yeah. So that was the story. But I, when I went down to the DABC again to try to get a license, they said, man, this was another one of those. Again. They said, you can't do that. If, you know, if, if we're going to change the law here in Utah, which is not likely, mm -hmm. if we did, it would come from this office. We'd have to sanction it. It would take two years. You're going to initiate a, a bill one season and come back and lobby it. And I said, I don't have two years. And uh, they just kind of dismissed me and said, you can't do that. So I can remember walking out of that door of that building down in Salt Lake City where the DABC was, just steaming and saying, you know, that guy just told me I can't possibly do this. And I was like, <laughs> and uh, I was like, that just, that just got me all fired up. Yeah. And we went ahead, introduced the bill to the legislature and got the law changed uh, in that same session. Um, in February of 1988, and that made brew pubs legal in Utah. So, this crazy guy that sponsored my bill, and that's the story how the how the whole legislative process worked, had to find someone to sponsor the bill. And none of the Mormon guys up here around Salt Lake were interested in Park City. Mm -hmm. So I found this crazy Greek um, character down in Price, Utah. His name was okay. Mike Dimitri, and I called him up and said, Mike. Um, you know, I want you to sponsor my beer to change the beer law and accommodate this brew pub concept. And he was laughing and going crazy. Oh, I told you to call me because he was the only probably beer drinker in the whole legislature. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. We'll do it. He goes, you need to know we'll never get it passed. I said, oh, yeah, we'll deal with that when, when the time comes. But let's go for it. So he said he put his name and sponsored the bill. Mm -hmm. came House Bill, I think, 213. And uh, we introduced it. And that, that story about how we got it passed was another example. I, in this case, I wouldn't call it necessarily any attribute. It was just a little bit of dumb luck um, getting it passed. But the reality was, or is, that there wouldn't be any brew pubs in Utah today if we hadn't been able to get that law changed because the, the whole mood of the Utah. So when I first got started, the Mormons didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Starting, I didn't have to get their permission to start a brewery. It was already on the books. But the brew pub was a different, different a concept that they weren't familiar with. So I was a little bit off the radar and the way we lobbied it was like, you know, you can buy beer, you know, from, from Milwaukee or, you know, LA, but you know, you might as well support the local businesses. And the Mormons weren't ever going to be customers, but they kind of had a, a business instinct and thought, you know, we'll get the tax and, you know, we're, we're pro business, we're pro economic development. So, um, they, they came along eventually. Yeah, for, fortunate there. And that also helped kind of pave the way for the 2002 Olympics that eventually came, right? Yeah, that was quite a ways away. We never would have dreamt it. We went through a whole bunch of, uh, I can remember watching the bid come in for the 2000 or the 1998 games that were held in Nagano, Japan. Mm -hmm. And I watched on TV 
and you know the the guy from the IOC, I forget his name, the guy, and open up the envelope, and we were so sure that Park City was going to get it because we had all of our venues built. I mean, we could we could do bobsledding, we could do ski jumping, and we thought you know we were good to go, and and that, that wasn't our first attempt to get the Olympics here in Utah. But I watched it, and then a guy said Nagano, Japan, and we all looked at each other like, what the hell? <laughs> Again, they didn't even have a road going to their site, much less any of the venues, right? Right. So we kind of got, um, I got mistreated in that episode. So they regrouped. They came home. You, you, I don't know if you remember the story. You might, you might remember that. Do you remember the controversy Utah got into with um, how they were ended up essentially bribing the IOC members to vote for us? And uh, I vaguely, I vaguely remember. Name, that. Yeah, it was totally true because. When they came back after we lost Nagano, we had a meeting and I was part of the committee, you know, that was trying to initiate this, this bid for the Olympics. Not a big player, but I was on the committee and this guy, the guy came back, um, his name was Tom Walsh. Yeah, it was, anyway, he came back and he, he explained to us all, he said, listen, in you know, the way this Olympic game is paid, the IOC guys vote and, um, this is the only job a lot of them have from countries all over the world, third world countries, and, you know, they use this as a source of income. And he said, listen, when we voted, and uh, when they voted in Birmingham, Birmingham, uh, England that, that day, mm -hmm. he said, we put out, they put out a new Sony computer on every door handle in the hotel for IOC members, and we put out saltwater taffy. <laughs> and they got the bid. So we said, okay, so... We said, that's the way the game is played. So we jumped in, just, just, we decided if that's the way the game is played, we'll figure out how to do it, maybe better. And so the IOC members would come to, to, to inspect our sites and man, we had guys getting their teeth fixed to the University of Utah. We had kids going to schools in Utah and full scholarship we had. I mean, we were bribing them every which way they turned, they, they couldn't get away from us. And um, I don't know exactly how much cash changed hands, but a lot of services and favors definitely changed hands. And that's where we ended up getting in trouble. And we were like, come on, everybody that's got the Olympics, summer or winter, has gone through this process. That's how the IOC operates. Yeah. You know, they're literally more corrupt than FIFA. Yeah. And uh, so we played the game, got the bid, and then later s some people uh, got in the news and it was, it, was, it was revealed that, yeah, we were bribing these IOC members every which way. And that's when Mitt Romney came in to try to clean up our, our bid and, pull off the Olympics. Up, yeah. So the Olympics came off and that was a big deal. I mean, I, I wasn't sure about them at first, but it ended up really being a lot of fun, really coming off. You got to give the people here in Utah a lot of credit for pulling it off. The traffic was actually more moderate than it was on a regular ski day because they had so much done in the way of traffic control and buses. And, and it was a really great crowd because instead of our normal, you know, West Coast, Midwest ski tourists, we had people from all over the world and that just made it really a, a fun party for it. We turned Main Street down to all car traffic in the evenings and just made a pedestrian mall. We yeah, had, I mean, I, I remember going to the venue. I mean, everything was absolutely first class. And, yeah. Uh, part of the great thing about the uh, Mormons, that they had so many different volunteers and missionaries. I helped. So many different yeah, languages. And the language skills was yeah, a big deal. Skills was a really big deal to help other nations, yeah. stuff like that. And, yeah, so the, the Olympics was... It was really good timing. I, um, it, it came into play and it set Park City on a, in a different trajectory as far as a ski town. And um, you now I don't know if we want to. I don't know if we want to do it again. I mean, <laughs> I, I think we got enough economic development going on. But you know, it would be fun to do it again. We're certainly ready to do it, and it, it, it makes sense to me to to kind of recycle the, the Olympic venues so you don't you know piss away a lot of money and these venues never get used. I mean. Our venues are pretty much self-sufficient, both from the foundation that was created, from the game revenue, and then just ongoing. So it, it's it's really it really changed the landscape in Utah, and certainly changed like the ability for the brew pub and the brewery to survive. We we were we were right on Main Street at that time, and mm -hmm. set up a beer garden right on that parking lot, next to us. And man, it was so much fun. We had people from all over the world, and we just had a blast. Now, not without a little bit of uh, controversy, right? Because I remember you got into a little bit of... Uh, <laughs> got a couple of issues that, for that. One was, you, uh, you might be referring to the polygamy porter. The, well, not, not only that, but yeah. also the... The uh, Provo Girl. <laughs> the Provo Girl. Provo Girl, yeah. Yeah, the St. Provo Girl. Yeah, we thought that was so funny. And we were way under the radar with this beer we called St. Provo Girl, which was literally a playoff of 
the city of Provo where they don't drink beer, and then the famous beer from Bavaria called St. Pauli Girl. And the Germans showed up for the Olympics and they got a hold of what we were doing. We had a gal dress up, a uh, Fraulein in a, in a Durndl mini dress. I don't know if you remember her, but she was, she had, she could cre create a real following and uh, <laughs> the Germans found out about it. The next thing I know, I get a cease and desist letter from St. Pauli Girl Brewery saying, you know, you're, that's a um, trade infringement and you can't do that anymore. So that kind of, th those lights kind of went on during the Olympics. I didn't have to deal with it until post Olympics. Mm -hmm where I ended up going back to Chicago and meeting with uh, their distributor and work negotiated a deal where um, we, we agreed to take the saint off and just call it Provo Girl. Got so it. That, now, that, also, you had a little uh, quarrel with, with Budweiser. Always. Which one are you thinking of? <laughs> I'm thinking of the, uh, the, what is now our Evolution Amber Ale, but the oh, unofficial. Yeah. That, yeah. That was, that was fun. Yeah, part of the Olympics, um, you know, you felt a little bit out of it because you had these big businesses like Budweiser and so many others come in with their sponsorship money and then expected some type, you know, and justifiably need, you needed some kind of return on their investment. So Budweiser controlled all the venues because they were the, they were the official sponsor of the 2002 Winter Olympics in, in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I said, fine. I don't have that kind of money. I'll just be the unofficial sponsor. So we came up with a beer that said 2002 unofficial beer. Um, and the IOC and the USOC didn't think it was nearly as clever and funny as I did. So like, again, I, I started getting cease and desist letters that you can't do that. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah. And it was like, I, I tried to develop it as a catch-22 concept. They said you can't be the, uh, you know, you can't, claiming to be involved with the Olympics. And I said, I just said, I'm the unofficial sponsor. I'm not the sponsor. They said, you can't not be the non-sponsor. You can't. And I said, okay. And I get these letters from the IOC with about 10, the masthead and the letterhead had like 10 international attorney law firms attached to it. And they would call me up and say, you can't be the unofficial beer. And I said, nah, you know, I, I, I understand. I couldn't be the official sponsor, but I'm just telling you, I'm not the sponsor. I'm not, I'm the unofficial sponsor. And so you can't do that. So we went round and round and, 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 it, and it, we had all kinds of, um, and, and then we, you know, we had the Clydesdales in their trailer on Main Street every day, which was really impressive, those Clydesdales and their you know, old Budweiser beer wagon. So what we did, I mean, I had two white Labradors, Bella and Blanca. We hooked up, I put some skateboard wheels from my son's skateboard on the bottom of a toboggan and we, we, we strapped two or three kegs on, on the toboggan and the dogs would follow the Budweiser wagon dragging our, our toboggan with the beer on it with, with my you know, nine-year-old son um, riding the kegs like he was riding a horse. And people loved that and uh, that was interesting. Budweiser didn't think it was very funny, but um, we didn't care. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great, yeah. Uh, another thing about the, you know, you have such creativity in a lot of the marketing that you did um, and also creativity in the beer. You know, I feel like nowadays, uh, everywhere you look, you have a blueberry or raspberry or strawberry and all the different IPAs and stuff like that. And I still remember um, my dad was working for a beer distributor on Long Island at the time, and he went out to a ski, ski trip at Snowbird. And this was like 93 or 94, something like that. And he went out with a bunch of his uh, beer distributor buddies, and they uh, – all loved the Wasatch and it was like blueberry ale or blueberry raspberry, ale. Raspberry, raspberry raspberry and yeah. that was back in like 93 or 94 yeah, we, they brought that, it back to their that beer. beer was a big big time hit i was a little bit ahead of my time of putting fruit in a beer and we couldn't keep up with the demand at the time and that's one of the reasons we expanded from park city to salt lake was the raspberry wheat beer um uh, but yeah that that was pretty innovative for a stay and that was back in what what 90s yeah early 90s yeah, and mid, yeah, early. early to mid 90s and it really took off and uh it was it was so unique to, for people we just we already made a beer we called wasatch gold was a light ale golden ale and we just threw some raspberry extract in it and it really was a big hit um you know it was a little adventurous in those days it, it, it was really appealing to to women um they weren't necessarily big beer drinkers because it just you know had a different 
taste than they were used to. And so that was a big deal. And I can remember when we, after the Widmers out of um, Portland, and I don't think Sierra Nevada was even close to dinner. We, they did the first half of Eisen, I think, and we did the second half of Eisen in the craft micro industry in those days. Although, no, Pyramid may have been doing a, a, a half of Eisen. But anyway, it was unique. And our customers here in Utah would bring the beer back and tell me there was something wrong with it because it was hazy. <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of an indicative of, of where the market was going and, or was and where, you know, it was going to evolve. And now they're drinking, you know, IPAs with 10% ABV and lo loads of hops and it's a whole different world. But in those days, um, people were still developing their, their beer palate. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think uh, really on the that you were so much on the forefront there with that because now I feel like it's gone so much past that where now it's just hard you know people are drinking hard spike seltzers and did you ever think you'd see the the day where that how, do you, how, how does the market transition from everybody drinking heavy alcohol IPAs loaded with a hundred IBUs of hops to drinking um, flavored water carbonated yeah, water I mean, how did that happen. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you know, you would think they would get more esoteric, but I guess that gap had never been had ever been marketed to. And of course, we know that that product, I think, is going to stick around. But that's just the fastest sector of growth, and probably the only sector of growth in the craft beer business right now. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable to see uh, now. Everyone's trying to catch up with those kind of leaders there. Yeah, so, uh, but, but I had one. one. I had one. I thought it was a. It was a brilliant idea of, of um, having a base for a vodka drink. That was all I was good for. Yeah, absolutely. So now, where did you get that creativity for your marketing? I mean, was that mainly you just trying to uh, yeah, it was determination, a trying to get some spots and some real um, creativity in the market? Yeah, it was a little bit of that survival instinct I was referring to earlier. We didn't, especially early on, we really, later on, we could afford to do a little bit of advertising and promotion, but early on, we didn't have a budget for that. So my strategy was to um, try to leverage whatever news coverage we could get. And that's, you know, and the way to get news coverage was to call up all the media. And I had them on my Rolodex in those days and call up, and, you know, KUTV and the Tribune and say, listen, we're going to um, have a protest and be, unofficial beer for the 2002 Olympics. So we're going to, uh, we're going to launch Evolution Amber Ale, which is really a protest beer. And they would say, what time, you know, where are you going to be? So we kind of used the, the media to, to um, make up for our advertising budget. So we would, we would get them. So then we'd end up on the evening news and in the Tribune. And that was a, one way to kind of mitigate our lack of advertising budget was to, was to get our name out there. And, the funny thing about Utah was really an advantage of marketing. It kind of, I should, I, just, I have to admit this, it didn't take a whole lot of um, genius because our markets were so defined. We had no, we had non-beer drinkers and beer drinkers, mm -hmm. and so when we made fun of the non-beer drinkers, it wasn't as if we could lose that customer. It was a customer we, you can't lose a customer you're never going to have. Sure, but our core customer loved it because they were in the same demographic that we were as you know beer drinkers. So they, the more fun we made of, of, the, of the local culture, the more our, our core customer thought we were doing a good job. Made it up. So, you know, and usually when you're marketing, you have to straddle that line between, you know, you don't want to offend this group or that group. You kind of have to make sure you're, you're, you're correct. And I didn't, we could just, we could go extreme. And, and in fact, got to the point where people would call us up or see me at the grocery store and want to know what we were going to do next. <laughs> you know what 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 irreverence could we come up with you know so we kept trying well speaking of i just finished my evolution amber ale unofficial 2002 right and the yeah. evolution I, let me just touch on that real quick but we have a second so the evolution was a, a double effort uh the beer stayed the same it was it was kind of an amber ale but um it was originally the 2002 and after a couple of years after the Olympics, you know, 2002 had kind of come and gone. People will certainly remember it, but it didn't have the unofficial, you know, it didn't have the same pop uh, 
that it had when we were hosting the Olympics. So right about that time, the Utah legislature came out with a bill that never got passed, but it was introduced. Mm -hmm. They were going to force school boards across the state of Utah, the state school board, to include um, creationism as part of their curriculum in their schools. I don't know if you're with them with creation, but that was that basically kind of an anti-evolution concept that yeah. hardcore religious people thought of as as somewhat anti-biblical or you know radical that people wouldn't you know that the world couldn't be created in seven days that's just ridiculous or I, we would say that but they would say you know the world was created in seven days and <laughs> so we thought that was ridiculous and, and my position really got me fired up because you know i would tell these guys you can take your religion it's a free country practice your religion don't you've already crossed that border between the separation between church and state at every chance you got this is too much yeah. So that's when it came out with Evolution Amber Ale, and we had a monkey getting bigger and bigger on the original label until he was standing up carrying a six-pack as a, as a human. And we said, this beer is made in 28 days, not seven. <laughs> and, uh, um, so we had a lot of fun. But that, that was a, a real political, cultural response that, you know, I took. That wasn't one I did necessarily with a grin. I was pissed off that they thought they could introduce theology um, in our public school system. Which they do, and they've done, and that's you know why they have a seminary across from every high school in Utah because yep. they don't know why build your own when you can treat the public system as your own. Yeah, no, it definitely uh, is. In, there's some great things about this state, and then you have some things on that opposite end of the spectrum. <laughs> we got to learn how to be. So one of the things, yeah, exactly. I had never been a minority before. I, you know, I grew up in Milwaukee in a it's kind of a suburban environment, and went to you know. Catholic schools for my years, and I, I, didn't, I, I always used to wonder why the minorities were so pissed off and kind of angry that they didn't have a presence or a voice or counted. And then I went to Utah, and I said, "Now I get why they're pissed off." Yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting place, but uh, we got yeah. more people coming. Good, bad, or I don't think I don't think our I don't think I always we're making a run at it. I don't know that our um, immigrants from around the country. Or around the world, and anyway, that's but around the country can keep up with the, the Mormon procreation, although that is coming down. Yeah, so now I'm going to move on to another one we get to talk about a little bit. This is oh, our, yeah, uh, polygamy porter. There, why well, have just one? Take one home for the wives, exactly. Now, this was around 2002 as well, right? Or a little actually, after again, I have to admit, there's a lot of elements in succeeding or, or surviving that come down to just old-fashioned dumb luck, and this probably is a good example. So in 2001, early in 2001, we had a beer that I really liked, and we just called it as Wasatch Porter. And people didn't know what a porter was a lot of times, and it just wasn't getting appreciated enough in my mind. And then I realized, you know, the name doesn't exactly get anybody's attention. So just, I, I don't know if you know who um, Porter Rockwell was, but, um, Rockwell Porter here in Utah. He was Brigham Young's bodyguard. He's called the Angel of Death. And he yep. wore the bullet holster you know, across his chest. And if, if you screwed around with Brigham Young, you had to deal with this guy. And uh, I went to the His Utah Historic Society and they said I, could, I had the rights, it was open rights to use this picture on the label. And I thought it was going to be so much fun. Um, and uh, so I went to, down to Salt Lake to a a group of people I collected at one of the downtown bars and I kind of did a market test and said, what do you guys think of this name? Um, Porter Rockwell. And they said, wasn't he a painter? I said, no, he's the angel of death. And I said, if these selected beer drinkers don't get the name, which I thought was pretty clever. Yep. Um, calling, ended up calling it Rockwell's Porter. Um, that I thought that that's not going to make any impact. So I kind of came back and, and then uh, I don't know how it came up. If I came up with it, it was in a discussion, but somehow we threw around the name Polygamy Porter. And of course, everybody was like, sure, if you can't do that. And I was like, oh, I can. And uh, so we ended up naming the, the beer Polygamy Porter, which is, you know, essentially is a pretty silly name, but we called it Polygamy Porter. And man, did that take off. We got, we started making t-shirts and sweatshirts. We were getting orders from all over the world. I mean, New Zealand, Japan, or we didn't know what e-commerce was in 2001. <laughs> we had no idea, but we, we, we found out what it was and we found out it was pretty powerful because we 
I mean, you can go around, I don't know if you've ever seen it outside the state, but there are, there are not so many now, but, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of polygamy porter shirts gear out there and we sold a ton of it. Yeah, we, I've absolutely we, seen it out. We took the servers, you know, before they went to work and we'd have them upstairs, cantina packaging, putting on UPS labels. I mean, we, the UPS guy would show up and do load after load after load of boxed up shirts. So, and then to kind of add fuel to the fire, and this is where I said it was dumb luck, that was 2001. Well, late in 2001, we were hitting our peak, and all of a sudden, you know what happened in 2002? It was the Winter Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the timing, you know, was incredibly fortuitous without ever uh, having planned it that way. It just evolved that way. And so the, the media started showing up in Utah. There weren't any races or competitions to cover, so they were doing cultural, local stories of Utah. And of course, the polygamy porter um, they thought was fun. And so that became a big darling of the media prior to the Olympics and then during the Olympics. And then um, when the Olympics were about ready to, to go off, I got a call one morning, really early. I was in the office early. I get this call and I pick up the phone, which I, you know, I tried to respond to. And um, this woman in a British accent, said, is, is this Wasatch Brewery? I'm looking for Greg Scherf. And I said, well, you, yes, you got both. You know, here we are. And the accent was so distinct. At first, I thought it was one of my friends. Um, but she said, I'm with The Economist magazine. And, you know, The Economist magazine internationally is a pretty big deal. And, yeah. Um, and I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. And she goes, you know, we'd like to have your permission to do a story and we'd like to interview you for more background and detail. And so we ended up getting a subheading in the Economist magazine. I wish I'd saved it, but it was, you know, like a header. They had like a full page story on Polygamy Porter, Utah and the upcoming Olympics. And man, that even fueled the, the internet um, business even more, getting that kind of exposure in the Economist magazine from, from England. So it just took off from there. And then we ended up having a lot of fun with it. You know, people, the Mormons never, they never, officially kind of tried to force me to stop doing it. They'd call me up, get a lot of complaints, and, I, and I, would, I would listen politely and say, I understand we're not trying to be disrespectful, but it is certainly still to this day as, a, as part of the, our culture here in Utah. I mean, there's, there's no denying that, and it's here, and we're in the beer business, and you guys are in the polygamy business. So um, we kept going on with it, but I did get a number of calls, and one that it kind of stands out this guy I'd listened politely to for a couple of minutes saying, you know, you can't do that. That's disrespectful. I don't know. He thought he, you know, he was the bishop and he could tell me what to do. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I said, <laughs> Is there anything else? And he went on and on. I said, listen, pal, you should do what I do. If I don't appreciate someone's advertising approach, you know, we see that on TV all the time. You go, oh, that's bad. So I said, if, if you don't like the way we advertise, I would make a suggestion that, that I've always followed. And he goes, what's that? I said, Simply don't buy the product. Don't support it. Yeah. You know, I was speechless on the phone because he never bought a beer in his life. <laughs> how was that gonna make how was that gonna help him out? You know, so he just he just looked at me like or didn't look at me, he was on the phone, he just kinda hung up. And uh, but anyway, that was always my response. If you don't like it, don't buy it. If you think it's good beer, you think it's funny, go for it. Yeah, I mean, for most, uh, not only is it is it great marketing, but uh, it's a fantastic beer as well. Won yeah. uh, gold medal at the World Beer Cup in what two thousand one. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I thought it got better. I don't know if you you um, appreciated the nitro version. I really we struggled making that because it was really hard. It wasn't so hard on draft, but to, I was a big fan of nitro beers because Guinness was always one of my favorite beers. Really hard to copy in a package, like a can or a bottle, because they had what they called a widget in it that released nitrogen. But yep. you know, I just love the presentation of a nitro beer with the nice creamy head and foam on it. My favorite. <laughs> what was the process like turning that uh, nitro into a can? It was a learning process. We had, we had really good. We, by that time, you know, we'd been around a while. I mean, we, at that point, we'd been in business for you know, 15, 20 years. So. We had a really great bunch of, always had these, you know, really highly professional, a guy named Dan Burke in those days, our brewmaster, but we had a lot of young kids. That one guy in particular, a guy named Adam Curfew, um, took on the challenge personally. And we did a lot of R&D to figure out how to get that nitrogen in that beer and have it be able to package. And, but when we did it, it was, it was really fun because um, 
like I said, it was easier on draft when you enter a keg, but when we started to bottle it, we really had to test our, our skill levels. But fortunately, we're, I thought we were up to. Yeah, it's, I love it. It's a fantastic beer, and the, the nitro version's uh, great as well. Now, Wasatch has always done fantastically at kind of those, uh, what is it, the, the kind of two great. big ones. Of the of course, too, there's a Great American Beer Festival. Great American Beer Festival. In the yeah, world. they had in Denver. They still have it, of course. And we were early on in those days. We'd go and, you know, be, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 people. Now, in an over two-day event, I bet it's, you know, 15 or 20,000. And then competing against 30 or 40 or 50 breweries, now you're competing against, how many did you say earlier? 7,500? and Over 7,500, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little harder to medal these days because you got a lot of competition. Although, during our height, one year we were actually named um, the at the same festival because we won enough medals combined and they have a, have a kind of a follow-up award for the brewery that gets the most medals and we got the most that year so we were named um let's see if i got it here we were named the brew pub of the year or the brewery of the year it was called uh yeah, utah brewers co-op uh, mid-sized brewing company brewer of the year that was in yeah so that was pretty damn cool um that was kind of the height of our and then you know we'd still get medals but um we never really got as much as many as we did that particular year yeah, you guys. I've, when I did the the research, I've done over fifty, which is uh, quite quite an impressive haul, to say the least. Stick, if you, I always say if you if you stick around long enough, you're bound to get a medal at some point. So. <laughs> now another one of the creative beers that uh, on the forefront uh, is that jalapeno cream ale. How did that come about? At a lot of beers, we would use the pub as kind of a tasting grounds or experimental laboratory if you will, because you can make, we can make beer in small batches and then use, we, and we didn't even have to give it away. We would offer it as a draft beer at the pub. People would come in and pay for it at the same time. So it was really a kind of a nice experience because people were buying the beer instead of having them, you know, sample it for free. So they were paying for it. And then you got feedback and you could, not only the feedback, you could, you could track the sales very easily about what was going through your, your draft. And uh, so, you know, honestly, Bobby, it wasn't one of my favorite beers because I'm kind of a gringo at the end of the day. And I'm not big on, on, you know, Mexican spices. or So it wasn't my go-to beer, but um, man, people that like a little extra kick or a little spiciness in their beer, it just hit a vein. And uh, we never packaged it. It was only offered on draft. It's still offered on draft. And that... That beer had a real loyal following. Even today, even today, I don't know if you know Wasatch Bagel guy, Craig. He, when they did, a, when they had the close for the virus, he gave all of his beers back to the distributor. Wouldn't let him take the the Wasatch cream uh, jalapeno ale because that's what he drank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely. Uh, I remember a lot of times in there that people would come in specifically just for that jalapeno cream ale. Yeah, if you like that flavor, man. It, it was a hit. It, I would say it was pretty polarizing because you had people that swore by it, and then on the other end, you like know, me, like, yeah. oh, I'll stick with my polygamy porter. Yeah, yeah, that's you know one of the reasons I, we ended up making so many beers is because you know there's such an expanding palate and there's there's such an adventure, adventurism in in the consumers that they just any I mean we'd have I don't know if you remember those days at the group pub when you'd go to a table and people go what's your new beer? Oh yeah. We would always constantly be rotating through. We had uh, several, yep, several new beers, and now they have. There's like 27, 28 of the taps have grown, and it's crazy how yeah, much. Yeah, crazy. No, when we had we had our original um, uh, tap offerings, we're, we had a standard with four beers, the draft standard. We, and we did our polyg or I'm sorry, we didn't put it before yet. We did the Wasatch Premium Ale, the Wasatch Gold, and then we'd have it like a Irish stout for St. For St. Patrick's Day period. And then I think we even had Coors on for a while because we didn't have any, that was all that we didn't have four beers. So we had to put on Coors on our original draft selection. Now, how much, what is the exponential growth that you kind of experienced, say, uh, when that brew pub opened to, you know, 10, 10 years later, even before the Olympics? Yeah. So as I mentioned, when I, when I knew I was not going to make it and I, uh, you know, and I was very motivated to make it. Mm -hmm. But we were just doing the brewery down in Iron Horse. It just 
wasn't making any economic sense. So that was motivation to get the law changed and do the brew pub. That was night and day. When we got the brew pub open, it was really exhilarating because it was the first time as an entrepreneur that I was making money, which was fun. <laughs> so um, before that, not so much, but the brew pub, like I said, the business plan, once we got it put in place, it's really a brilliant business plan because I mean, how many businesses do you think of that produce their own product, offer it without transportation, without a distributor, without packaging? Not many. <laughs> so that's when we, and that, and that was, and that also had a natural marketing uh, t advantage to it too, because we'd have people come into the brew pub, like the beer, and we tell them, well, it's available in a bottle at your grocery store. And conversely, people would, see the beer at the grocery store and say, oh, there's a brew pub on Main Street. So it, it, it kind of fed off each other and, and uh, had a, a certain marketing uh, strategy that, not even a strategy, a, a marketing, market, marketing uh, effort that complemented each profit center. So we started to grow from that point and from about 1989, 1990, we actually started to be profitable. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it also helped with the, I feel like the seasonal following because I, you know, the years when I was there, we'd always have people every winter that would come back and no matter what, they were at least stopping in one day out of their trip to yeah. the group up because they've been there every you year. Did have, you know how busy it would get, especially during the ski season. And in those days, it, you know, if you were here for a week and people in those days used to book Saturday to Saturday, a week at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, we were just... We really, you know, how we got the brew pub built is another story. You know, getting the property on Main Street um, was a real fortuitous event with the city, city council and, and the planning department. And uh, things were so dead on Main Street in 1987, 88, and then we finally got up in 89. Mm -hmm. The city was, was, unlike some of their responses today, the city was so supportive and so bullish and like, you got to do this. We'll, we'll sell the land. The city owned the land that we built the group for by. And they also served as the Economic Development Commission. So they would just, at the end of their meeting, they would turn into economic development. And uh, the mayor at that, or not the mayor, the city planner at that time was a really, gal that was really important to our, our future was, her name was Arlene Lobel. She just recently passed away, but she was very supportive. So we ended up buying the land for the group, from the, for the group pub from the city their economic development agency okay. and uh, really got a sweet deal. And then being on Main Street, as you know, was you couldn't, I mean, if you're going to come to Park City, you're going to hit Main Street. And if you're going to hit Main Street, you're going to check out the bars and certainly in those days, you know, we used to do tours because brew pubs were so novel. People couldn't believe we were brewing our beer there and they'd want to see people in action. Mm -hmm. Now, these days, it's hardly novel. I mean, people don't do brewery tours anymore because they've done a hundred of them by this time. So in those days, it was still on the unique edge of uh, beer making. Now, as it, as it continued to grow, where, what was your ultimate goal? What was kind of... Well, it kind of evolved a little bit. You know, the original goal from day one was just pay the, pay the rent, pay, the, pay the, the bank, and stay alive and you know, make enough. And then once I realized that uh, the brew pub was going to be, you know, then we started to get more ambitious and... Mm -hmm. We were starting to make beers. And then all of a sudden, by the mid 90s, the craft industry is now starting to gain some momentum. And in the old days, you know, it was bad news, good news. We didn't have, people weren't really caught on to craft beer yet. But, and so nobody was opening new breweries. So we kind of had a captive market. And so there was a period there where we kind of hit the sweet spot where the consumer was starting to really be attracted to and identifying with craft beer. And the competition hadn't caught up. Well, that's certainly. It's not the case today and the competition has caught up. But for that period, we were able to really grow and, 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 and uh, you know, have a good business going. And uh, because of that response, we were, we were, at one point in 1991 or 92, I think, we brewed 387 straight days, so more than 352 in a year, with a double shift. Wow. So that was two brews a day, a 15 barrel brew house, um, so we do 30 barrels a day, um, every day. We had a brewing staff of like five or six guys and we just, and pretty soon we just, we, there was the beer started to suffer because we, we couldn't let it, 
really develop. Uh, Ail really likes, you know, at least 10 or if not 14 days sure. conditioning. And we were trying to rip them out in seven, six or seven days. So that wasn't really good for the beer. So we decided to build a real serious brewery down in Salt Lake. It was a 50 barrel brew house and had a much um, expanded capacity. And that's how we met the demand. And, and that turned out to be a, a, a little uh, dicey because it's like a lot of, you know, you see the business growing and you try to respond and then you respond and, the, and all of a sudden we had a, a lot of other craft breweries coming into the marketplace. So we, for a while there, we actually had extra capacity in Salt Lake and on like Park City where we had no capacity to add to it. So we survived that and then we ended up merging with squatters in 2000. Gotcha. That made a big, that was a big difference. Talking about business evolution and profitability. So when we merged with squatters, I became partners with Jeff Pelley Cronus and Peter Cole, who were the founders of Squatters. Mm -hmm. And they had been friends from our, our real estate days in Park City where they're both realtors at the same time I was. So we had a, a basic friendship going on. And um, originally they called me up and said, you, you want to go to lunch? This is 1989. And they went out to lunch. I said, yeah, those days I'll go to lunch with anyone. You know, sounds great. <laughs> So we went out to lunch and they said, we wanted you to be the first to know we're going to start the second brew pub in Utah, down in Salt Lake, and calling it Squatters. And I said, absolutely fantastic. We're, we, you know, we're trying to educate the consumer and um, more help the better. And we don't, you know, we're not concerned about the competition. That's a you know, free country and we can help in some way, let us know. And so we competed. Um, we competed. I mean, we were competing for the market eventually because they started to introduce a package um somewhere along the line and then in 2000 i got together with them which we did periodically with peter and jeff and said listen um we had originally met with doing a kind of a third party cooperative where we would share a, a brewing bottling facility and, and then keep our own beer separate and independent okay and i met with them and i said you know the beer business is just too competitive you know one day you're going to want to um you know um make a beer, a squatter's beer, and I'm going to want, you know, respond with a Wasatch beer. And it's just not going to, I don't, I don't think it'll work. Why don't we both go back? And we're about the same size at the time. I said, let's go back and do some um, number crunching. Um, just, I'm going to just take my numbers and double them as if you were a partner and you do the same and see if, what the profit, profitability looks like. So we both went back and got, put, got back together in a week or so and looked at each other and no one said anything at first. And then we said, holy shit, this makes <laughs> a lot more sense. Yeah. So then and in the year 2000, I became partners with uh, Peter Cole and Jeff Polychronos from Squatters. And that, that created a critical mass in our production, especially of our packaged products. Mm -hmm. That made a whole lot more sense. And did that collaboration also help in uh, creating new beers and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, those guys weren't, they weren't terribly involved with the day-to-day -day operations of Squatters, okay. where I was pretty hands-on, you know, every day going back between Park City and Salt Lake and and I was in the thick of it. And they, early on, they said, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to be tied down to being in operation. They, they still had a, a hand in downtown squatters on Broadway. And uh, so basically when we merged, I picked up another brewery to market and sell, lost a competitor and gained that critical mass all at the same time. And they, and they were great partners, um, really wonderful partners because usually my, my experience is, you have partners and you're successful everything tends to be a lot easier to deal with it's when par partners are losing money that it becomes more complicated but since we were making money and they were good guys and they understood the challenges they were just wonderful partners very supportive but i didn't i wouldn't see them but for once a month or once a quarter mm -hmm. now would you say I was, oh, sorry. I was gonna say i was the operations guy and they were they were on the board of directors now, would you say uh, right on that, um, that that is a big part of your success? Because, I mean, I, being able to taste the beer or whether it's the food that's coming in out of the brew pub, you know, quality control, making sure everything was up to your standard, um, yeah. that, that helped? Yeah, I was pretty hands-on. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't have any real restaurant background. That's where Paul Brown comes into the equation. But uh, I was definitely enthusiastic about the beers. Uh, I never, I was unique in the, craft brewery business world but the, the original um craft brewery or microbrewery guys typically the guy um you know the tom bonds and the 
and the Woodmere brothers and Ken Grossman from Sierra. Those guys were all their brewmasters of their, you know, brewing the beer. You know, I, I brewed beer um, as a kind of a support staff, but I was never the, the real guy. So um, that was unusual, but, you know, I like to think I developed my palate over the years, but, um, you know, that, that was part of the experience, but I was definitely hands-on and, you know, all about beer drinking and all about new beers and how we can make them better. Sure. Now, once you guys kind of uh, joined together, did you see eye to eye on what you wanted the goals to be for uh, UBC or you not really discussed too much? Or no, we, we had regular board meetings and, and even beyond that, we had certain contact and Peter Cole had a lot of ideas continuously and a lot of them became you know, to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we would have spirited discussions about the direction, but we never had an impasse or had anything, you know, they were really great partners. If, if I felt strongly about a product, a new development or a new product, um, it would, it would get done. And if they had an idea that made sense and they liked and were, you know, were enthusiastic about, I would make that happen. So we, you know, that's what partnerships do. They, you compromise and you work together and it's sure. not just about you. That's, that's, that's a partnerships. And like I said, Earlier, if, if you're making money, those decisions become a lot easier. Absolutely. Now, when did you feel that you kind of uh, reached your apex with um, Wasatch Beers and UBC and Squatters? Yeah. Well, actually, that whole concept of exiting the business um, really wasn't my initiative. Peter and Jeff had thought of it was time um, to move on, and they had kind of tested the waters out there to see what was going on. This was, um, let's see, what year would that have been? Uh, probably about 2013 or 14. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of stuck their toe in the water to see what kind of interest it would be for someone acquiring us. Mm -hmm. And then they asked me if I'd uh, be interested. And at first, I, I you know, wasn't totally bullish on the idea because I was having a lot of fun and we were making money. And I, I was, um, you know, still 58 or something. I, you know, I thought I had a few years left. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, you said earlier, you know, did we have impasses? And those guys have been such great partners, uh, you know, for the 10 or 14 years, whatever it was, since 2000, that uh, when they said, we really want to do this. And uh, I just thought it was, it, it wasn't so much the timing, but, if, if they wanted to do it and they weren't going to be happy, um, you know, if they wanted to, you know, exit, um, it really wasn't something that I, I felt comfortable creating um, some kind of opposition to. So, like I said, I didn't initiate the idea, but I certainly went along with it. And uh, so in 2014, 15, I don't know if your research showed any, but um, about six years ago, six, yeah. yeah. We got some initiatives or some interest from a number of, of companies to come in and buy us out. And we entertained probably three or four serious offers and obviously took the best one, which was a, a company out of Boston called Fireman Capital, a private equity firm. What was that process like for you? It was, it was brutal. It was brutal on two two levels. It was even more brutal on a lot of the staff, especially the accounting staff, because they went into a due diligence mode because they're a public, not a public company, but a company that has a lot of exposure and a lot of investor types. So they had to, they came in and man, they looked under every rock and looked at every invoice and every bit of our history. And, you know, they asked more questions and we were actually in due diligence with them for about six or seven months. And that was brutal. But that's the way companies, you know, they're a smart company. They had a lot of experience to buy a company. So they don't come in and say, oh, this looks good. Here's a check. Yeah. No, and they're like, you know, lift up your skirt and show us what you got. And, <laughs> um, so we had to do that. Um, it was tough. And it was tough on me because I felt it really invasive. Um, you know, people asking, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And before, I never really answered anybody. You know, certainly Peter and Jeff on the board level. But So that was brutal. And then, of course, it was obvious that I'd be in transition after they finalized the purchase. So, you know, that kind of was a, you know, because I had been doing it for 
so many years it was really in in my blood and just, mm -hmm. it was really my child if you will and sure it was hard to say goodbye or to, to transition they say goodbye they wanted me to stick around for a year or so maybe two the help of that became you know i, I kind of cut that short because you, know, you can't have it both ways you can't cash in your chips and still be the man you know you can't it doesn't work that way yeah can't tough to put the toothpaste back in the tube so, so and to say goodbye yeah and did, how difficult of a pro i mean obviously it's good on one aspect but how difficult is it when you see the growth yeah it was hard and i still certainly have emotional you know times where i, I would you know it's mostly the people people like you bobby and then all the people not just at the brew pub but then down at the salt lake brewery they were the, the vitality and the enthusiasm to go to work every day and see these kids mature and grow up now doing stuff like you're doing that was really the best part of, the, of running a business and that's the part I miss the most was the people and um, just all everybody as a team working to advance the agenda of, of growing and you know, making better and better beers, making the restaurant um, better when, in any way we could. So that, you know, I was into it. I mean, I, that was what I got up every morning to do. So, so the transition was, was kind of a mixed bag too. I mean, I was still around everybody, but I, I couldn't make the final call um, on decision making. So eventually I just decided to move on. I, I kept the brew pub uh, property, the real estate and the building that housed the Wasatch brew pub. And I just I became a landlord because the new company owned the business and I owned the building. So they just ended up paying me rent. So I, that's still the scenario today, although. That's a good play. <laughs> um, nobody, the problem is with restaurants closing, nobody wants to pay rent anymore. <laughs> Now, for so for the the entrepreneur out there, someone that's going into uh, beer brewing and, and things like that, what would you, what would you say to them? What would what would you? Uh, wise you know, I I was I was a philosophy major, so I didn't have a real business background. I think the more research you can do, like I was talking about firing capital, the due diligence. If you want to start a business, that's great. You should go for it, but you got to do as much homework as you can, and. Uh, at some point you got to take the leap of faith. I mean, you, 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 know, uh, you got to have, you know, people, have, what are the attributes of someone that's successful in business? And we talked earlier about that um, determination, but I also think an entrepreneur by their very nature has to have a level of confidence mm -hmm. that they can do it. And it's like when I told the guy down at the Department of Alcohol and Beverage Control that I was going to change the, the state law to allow brew pubs, and he told me you know, I couldn't do it. You know, I had to have a certain amount of self-confidence to say, yeah, I could. And I think that's an integral part of, of being an entrepreneur is if you don't believe you can do it, likely nobody else will. So you got to be the, you know, the prime mover. You got to be the guy that, that makes it happen. And uh, so, yeah, the, the you know, self-confidence, you got to be, it's a slippery slope. You know, my self-confidence or self-esteem to evolve into a narcissistic trait that alienates employees and other people because it's not a very likable quality but yet you have to have the self-confidence said if you if you don't think you can do it no one else is coming along so that's a kind of a, 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 a um, slippery slope or type of you have to walk but i think it's an integral part of being an entrepreneur if, if you don't believe in yourself you, you probably shouldn't go that direction you gotta have some belief what else do you think uh drove uh, where, where did, where did that drive come from for you? I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think it's somewhat, you know, it's either instinctiveness or your DNA. I think a lot of it came early on cause you know, I'm only five, eight, but I, I, I never thought I was short, you know, yeah. I thought I was like average size or six foot or something. So that's, like I said, that self-esteem. I just had a lot of competitiveness and it goes back and I'll give you an example. And I was, did I tell you this already about the football example? Uh -huh. um, but it was that um, kind of innate confidence and a, I guess coupled with a fear of failure of not, not being a success. I thought that success was, was um, uh, it was the most important thing. I mean, you, if you started something, you had to be successful and I just was never willing to give up no matter what the, the odds or, or, or what the obstacles were. And I think that that dogged 
uh, determination coupled with a healthy amount of self-esteem and then that um, determination. It, for me, it didn't come down to brains or anything else. It just came down to a, um, a really dogged determination to, to not fail and to be successful. And that got me going. Now that, that fear of failure, because you meet uh, a lot of different uh, people with their outlooks on it and some of it is loving to win hating to lose or so fear of failure you think that kid, was that like mom and dad kind of growing up not wanting to disappoint them no. well I certainly wanted to make them proud that's for sure, sure. I mean and I, I wanted to um, prove the doubters wrong and I wanted to um, accomplish I was driven you know I don't think what, what you just uh, related to is they're all that different. They're almost synonyms, but um, yeah, the fear of failure is, is one way to describe it. Um, I, I think that may be oversimplified, but the, I think coupled with the desire to be successful, I mean, I, I really, um, I really wanted to make uh, a mark and I wanted to do something. And that's why I was so selective about choosing a business to get involved with or starting a business. And the, and the brewery idea in Utah was so much fun because A, people said you couldn't do it. B, you know, the idea of beer in Utah was crazy. And, you know, beer, crap brewery hadn't arrived yet. Um, so there were a lot of obstacles. And I just said that, that as, you know, as a hippie who, you know, in 1970, early 70s, I thought I was, you know, going to be part of the group that changed the world. So I was, I was really ambitious to, to get involved and do something different. And, prove the establishment wrong and kind of, you know, that I, I guess you'd call that a competitiveness. Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's certainly safe to say that you changed our state uh, for the better. Absolutely. So. So, a little bit. Uh, I think, and I've told this before, but the fact that um, this guy, Mike Dimitri, who was my legislature buddy who sponsored the bill and then some other guys that helped out like Gordon Strong, a uh, guy, locally and then another guy who ended up uh, supporting the, the bill kind of glenn brown who was our local representative you know none of that would happen without those guys but again i, I the, the audacity of you know a 29 year old kid or whatever i was going into the state legislature and saying i'm going to change the beer law you know that stuff that stuff uh, doesn't really make any sense that, that was just that was the, the, you know maybe a little too much self-confidence going on there but i was determined and you need that there is that a fine line right of that self-confidence I'm, sure I'm sure you see it on, on your athletic uh, venues uh, experiences Bobby, that anybody gets out there to compete and do what you did um if you didn't think you could do it you had no chance right sure absolutely and I mean, it's amazing to think now you look at, you look at our state, you look at all the different uh, breweries and distilleries. I mean, you helped pave the way for High West on Park City and David Perkins. I know you guys had a pretty good relationship and you were able to help him yeah. cut through some red tape and stuff like that. So, I mean, it has to make you pretty proud. Yeah. Look along I wish I'd been a bigger investor or investor. I, I really was confident he'd be successful, but he hit a home run, as you well know. <laughs> Absolutely. So it has to make you proud to look around the state and see all the different distilleries and craft breweries that are now. It does. Uh, I, have to admit, I have to admit it does. It's pleased. Well, uh, on a personal note, I, you know, I just want to make sure that, uh, that you know how much I appreciated uh, all the years while I was competing. You allowed me to work there and make money for my ski career. And uh, there's not many places that allow you to come in and right when it's about to be busiest you turn and leave to go ski all winter so well I really do appreciate it greg you're so welcome it's guys like you and so many others that made it all happen in the sense that you know wonderful and that's what i was alluding to earlier i missed all that and you know miss being around you guys when i'd come back up to the brew pub after being in salt lake and catch up with everybody and loved your career uh, process and progress and uh, now seeing what you're doing now it's just you know, it's very um, satisfying. Well, well, thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming on. It's been great to uh, listen Good to for you, man. all of your success. And thanks for being such a pioneer and allowing us yeah. to drink a little beer. Well, back at you. I'm proud of you. Keep up the good work and hope it uh, takes you where you want to go. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. All right, Bobby. You're a good guy. Thank you.